professor of molecular engineering at the University of Chicago. Uh, he was one of the founding faculty in the new molecular engineering program uh, developed at University of Chicago, and it's a superb pioneering program that spans um, everything, all kinds of materials and focuses on new molecular science. At the same time, he's a professor in, uh, he, was, he went to Chicago from the University of Wisconsin where he was professor of chemical engineering. And he's now the vice president also for the National Laboratory. He's the vice president um, for science, stra science strategy, innovation, and global initiatives for the national laboratories that are administered by the University of Chicago. So University of Chicago um, is the steward for both Fermi Labs and Argonne Labs. So it's a huge, huge job to interface with the Department of Energy and run those labs, build programs, and make sure that these serve the national interests. And so Juan is in charge of that at the University of Chicago. So huge job. Um, and he still has an enormously uh, productive and uh, impactful research group. Um, he was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering in 2016 and uh, was awarded the Polymer Physics Prize from the Prize from the American Physical Society in 2018, the DuPont Medal for Excellence in Nutrition and Health Science in 2016, the Intel Patterning Science Award, the Charles Stein Award from AICHE, and he was chair of the Mathematical and Physical Sciences Advisory Committee to the NSF, and importantly, to the profession of founding editor of Molecular Systems Design and Engineering. And he's had many um, of his patents licensed and go into practice in a number of different areas because he has impact, uh, he works on polymer, all kinds of molecular engineering, biological macromolecules. And importantly, he's also published a molecular thermodynamics textbook. And when I first started um, teaching physical chemistry in, in BE 2110, I actually consulted with Juan to get advice about how to best teach this to undergraduates. And his book was incredibly helpful in that regard. Um, so you may wonder what is a tissue engineer doing um, introducing Juan to Pablo uh, for students. Um, you uh, have a community of people you go to graduate school with that you never escape. Juan and I were graduate students together in chemical engineering at UC Berkeley. He was in John Prowson's group working on thermodynamics. I was across the plaza in Lewis Hall working on mammalian cell culture, but my best friend who says hello to you, Juan, Rebecca Bainan, uh, was co-advised by my advisor and John Prausnitz. And so she was a bridge and she told me wonderful stories about the goings on in the Prausnitz group, which was mostly, uh, there weren't many women in chemical engineering there. Unfortunately, I don't have much time to share with you some of the very uh, fun stories of Juan in graduate school. He threw amazing parties. Um, from which uh, I stayed in touch with him. And we ended up um, hanging out at AICHE meetings back in the day when you had to, you could get a super cheap plane ticket staying Friday night over. And we actually went uh, snorkeling in Pinnacamp State Park in Florida one year because we had to stay over a Saturday night. So he's a, a really tremendous colleague in the field, tremendous mentor to students. Uh, very fascinating and inspiring work, and I'm looking forward to hearing the um, talk today. Juan. Thank you, uh, Linda. Thank you for the uh, very warm introduction. It is good to see uh, so many friends and uh, former students in the chat. Uh, you look great. I wish we could be together in person, but we cannot. So. Oh, Juan, well, uh, apologies. One more thing. If you have questions, can you please type them into the chat? I will moderate the questions at the end. If you have a clarifying question and you need me to break in, type clarifying question and I will interrupt Juan, but I'll, I'll be the one to moderate the chat. Apol apologies for forgetting to say that. Go ahead, Juan. All right. So uh, the story that I want to tell you about today has to do with, uh, with polymers, but, but it is a special kind of polymer. These are uh, liquid crystalline polymers that are active. They exhibit uh, self repulsion and as a result of that, um, they um, have a number of properties that uh, we don't understand very well. We like to understand them better and then uh, put them to good use. So uh, what I'll do today is tell you about those materials and uh, what we're doing to try to understand them a little bit better. This is a collaboration with my colleague, uh, Margaret Gardell, who does the uh, experimental work. She's in uh, physics and at the PME at Chicago. 
And this is really the work of uh, two uh, outstanding postdocs, Ray Zhang and uh, Nathan Kumar, whose pictures you see over here. So the uh, outline of the talk is uh, very simple. Uh, this has to do with defects, defects in liquid crystals. These defects are very good things that one can use for applications. So I'll begin by telling you what they are. I will then uh, discuss the dynamics of these defects. And then I will discuss how we can control these dynamics in active polymeric liquid crystals. So um, with that, let's uh, get started. So first of all, defects at, uh, at rest. So what are defects and how can we use them? Um, a very useful picture that one can use to uh, understand uh, liquid crystals and defects in general is the one that you see here. So these are actually uh, uh, kayaks on the lake. It's a competition, I think, where they were trying to see how many uh, kayaks you can actually pack onto the surface of a lake. Don't tell me, don't ask me why they were doing this, but they were doing it. And you can see that this is a, a, a nematic phase. It's a liquid crystalline because you have a local order. You see a, a, a director, which tells you what is the average orientation of the kayaks as a function of space. And then uh, in here, you see the director pointing this way. Can you see my mouse, by the way, um, moving here? Uh, yes, just yeah, about. Yes, yes. Right, so that will use that as a pointer. So you see a director pointing this way here. Over here, you see the director pointing in a different direction. And then at the place where these different directions meet, you have this order over here. Well, that's a defect, okay? So you see a defect here, you see another one here. Depending on the uh, orientation of the defect, we can actually assign a charge to a defect. The one that you see here is a plus one half defect on the right. The one on the left is a minus one half defect. These are topological defects. And plus and minus, just like electrostatic charges, attract each other. And eventually they want to disappear. You want to eliminate all of these problems from the system. So at equilibrium, if you were able to get there, you would have a uniform material, all right? Now these are kayaks. Um, let's assume that uh, you don't have one, but you have a raft, right? Like the one that you see here on the right. Now, if you jump into this competition, into this lake with your raft, I can assure you that sooner or later, that raft will find its way into the defects in the material. And the reason for that is that uh, there's empty space. You can actually fit right there without perturbing the rest of the material. So the uh, enthalpic cost of putting the raft in the defect is relatively small. So that's the driving force really to, uh, to uh, go to these topological defects. Now, the same picture that I showed you with uh, kayaks applies at molecular scales with uh, molecules. Whereas you increase the density of the material, you can form an emetic phase. Depending on that density, you will be disordered, isotropic, nematic, or smectic. And we characterize the phase that we're in using the so-called uh, scalar or the parameter, which is the largest eigenvalue of the tensor that you see over here, which has the director U. All right, so this is the dyadic product of the director. Okay, now in uh, this presentation, I will be using theories that we write in terms of this uh, tensor or the parameter that you see uh, here. So when you see Q, I'm referring to a tensorial representation of the order in the system. That's how we characterize the orientation of the liquid crystal as a function of space. All right. So um, I gave you a picture in terms of uh, kayaks. We can go to molecules and exactly the same thing happens as a said a moment ago. One of the molecules with which we do a lot of our experimental work in liquid crystals is called a 5CB. You see a picture uh, uh, over here. It is the fruit fly of liquid crystal research. And one of the things that you find is that uh, just as in the kayak system, 
you form topo topological defects. And then when you insert particles into the system, nanoparticles, those nanoparticles find their way into the defects. That's illustrated with a diagram that you see here on the right. Let's assume that you have a liquid crystal shown here in orange. Let's assume that you have a surface nearby and that the orientation of the liquid crystal at the surface is parallel. Let's also assume that the orientation of the liquid crystal molecules at the surface of a nanoparticle is perpendicular. So now you have these molecules going that way, these ones going that way, and then at the place they meet, you have a defect. In two dimensions, it is going to be a plus one half or a minus one half defect. In three dimensions, you can see that you will not have a point anymore, but you will have a line that surrounds the liquid crystal. So we're gonna call that a Saturn ring defect. And in here, you see a picture of that defect. So you see the nanoparticle suspended in a liquid crystal, and now you see the Saturn ring that surrounds it, okay? Now, one of the things that uh, we like to do is understand defects a little bit better. And it turns out that they're very small, they're nanometer scale, they're very difficult to characterize. So to do that, we're going to rely on models of a liquid crystalline material. So what you see over here are representative simulations of uh, the liquid crystal that I was telling you about a moment ago near an air interface. So we have a liquid crystal film suspended in air. And we think that at that interface, the order of the liquid crystal is going to change dramatically. So that should be a good proxy for what we think should happen at defects. So the first thing that we're gonna do is simulate this interface, and then we're gonna compare the results of our experiments, of our simulations to experiment, and then see if we actually have a reasonable understanding of that interface. And then if that works, we're gonna try to use these models on defects and learn something new about defects for which we do not have experiments. So these are images of our simulations at different temperatures. The color corresponds to the magnitude of the order parameter. At high temperatures, the system is disordered, so the order parameter is close to zero. At lower temperatures, you form an emetic phase. So now the color is brownish, which corresponds to an order parameter of about 0.5 or 0.6. So you undergo an isotropic to nematic transition. On the right, you see uh, experimental and uh, simulated curves that tell you what is the density profile of the liquid crystal as a function of distance to the interface. So that is the interface here. That is the bulk of the film. Each color corresponds to a different temperature. On the top panel, we have 5CB, one liquid crystal. On the bottom panel, we have a different liquid crystal, 8CB. And the point that I want to make here is that uh, the agreement between the lines and the symbols, experiment and simulation is very, very good. These are predictions. And you see that these models are actually able to capture all of these changes that occur at an interface without having to uh, fit parameters or anything. So these are true predictions, which gives us faith in the models that we're gonna be using now to characterize defects, okay? So I'm gonna do the same thing that I uh, did with the experiments that I showed you a moment ago. We insert a nanoparticle into a liquid crystal. The nanoparticle would be here, but I've erased it for clarity. And then I look at what is the influence of that particle on the rest of the material. Again, the color corresponds to the order parameter. So you see that immediately after the interface of the nanoparticle, you start to develop oscillations in the order of the system. It goes down, up, down, up, but it is always pneumatic. And then over here, if you follow that uh, arrow, you see that all of a sudden you run into this red region over here where the order is much lower than in the rest of the system. Well, that is the defect that I was talking about. All right, so the order is lower at the defect and the density is also lower. So we've learned a lot of things from these simulations. First of all, 
now we know that the size of a defect is about three nanometers. And that is important because we used to think that the size was 10 nanometers. It's more like uh, two or three nanometers. Second of all, we've learned that the uh, density in the core of the defect is lower than in the rest of the material. And it is lower by a lot, by about uh, 10 to 15%. In a liquid system, that is a tremendously large density difference. And third of all, we've learned that when we have uh, mixtures of various components, the composition of the defect is very different from that of the rest of the material. So defects are indeed special environments with different densities, different compositions, and different structures than the bulk of the liquid crystal. Now, just as uh, particles can be trapped by defects, impurities or different molecules can be trapped into these defects. So what I'm doing here is actually, uh, I'm sorry about that, taking, for example, a molecule of uh, toluene, I think, disease, and I'm calculating what is the free energy of that toluene molecule as I drag it across the defect. And when I calculate that uh, free energy, I find that there's a free energy well at the defect. That is the propensity for this toluene molecule to be trapped at the defect is relatively high. It prefers to be there than in the bulk of the material. So now this starts to be interesting because I could use this, for example, to uh, attract impurities, to purify systems, or I can use this to actually carry out perhaps chemical reactions in the environment provided by the defect uh, uh, itself. So that's what we've done over here to test some of these ideas. We uh, created a defect in a liquid crystal by introducing a colloidal particle. So that would have been the Saturn ring defect that I showed you a moment ago. And then as an impurity, we introduce a surfactant that likes to form uh, vesicles, multilamellar vesicles. So the idea would be that this surfactants would go preferentially to the defect, self-assemble there, and then form the micelle that follows the shape of the Saturn ring. We use fluorescently labeled surfactants, so you can actually see them assembling at the Saturn ring. And then we chose a chemistry that allows us to polymerize these surfactants. So when we shine light, this uh, multilamellar vesicle becomes polymerized, it is now a ring polymer, if you will. And when we shake the system, it actually comes off the colloidal particle. And now you see it floating away over here. So that's a polymer that was actually polymerized within the defect. In here, you see a cryo TEM image of the multilamellar vesicle. So you see different layers. These would be nanometer uh, uh, lens scales. The point that I'm trying to make uh, with this slide is that uh, defects in liquid crystals can actually be a very useful thing. You can use them to uh, purify systems, to carry out chemical reactions, and perhaps other things that we have not even thought about uh, yet. Okay. So those are the uh, defects in liquid crystals. That's why we like them. That's part one of the of the lecture, okay. Now let me uh, move on and introduce the uh, concept of activity in uh, liquid crystalline systems. And we're gonna do that in the context of uh, tubulin. So tubulin are these um, um, very, very uh, long uh, uh, molecules that can measure uh, uh, tens of microns. You can actually uh, uh, get these tubules to move using motor proteins. So the way it works is that these motor proteins that are shown on the diagram that you see on the left, walk along two tubules at the same time. In doing so, they exert a force and that force, that extensile force, causes the whole thing to flow and to move. So on the right, you're actually seeing, seeing experiments by uh, uh, Zonomir Dogic and co-workers 
in which you have a liquid crystalline system made out of these tubules. You see defects, just as the ones that I was uh, showing you uh, before, except that now the scales are much longer. They're not kayak scale, but they are many microns uh, scale. And you see that the system is actually moving on its own. So the question that arises now is do the, do the rules of the game now, the character of these defects and the liquid result change at all when we have dynamics in the system, when we have all of these hydrodynamic forces that are introduced through the motion of the motor uh, uh, proteins. So to understand this, we're going to have to resort to theory. We cannot use simulations anymore because the land scales are too long for that. I'm going to introduce a, a density functional theory that allows us to describe these materials. I won't go into the details. Uh, it is not uh, particularly uh, complicated. This is a theory that works with the order parameter tensor that I described a moment ago. We have three contributions. First, we have enthalpic contributions that tell us whether a system is disordered or pneumatic. Then we have elastic contributions that penalize deformations of the liquid crystal in different directions. So think of this as uh, a harmonic expansion, uh, harmonic springs with different coefficients that penalize deformation in different directions. And finally, we have surface contributions that tell us what is the penalty associated with uh, deforming the liquid crystal in the vicinity of a surface. All of these contributions are a function of position because the order depends on where you are on the system. To predict the order in the system, we minimize this free energy function with respect to the field of view that we're trying to work with. Okay, now importantly, all of these constants that appear in the theory, the elastic constants or the uh, anchoring coefficient can be predicted from simulations of atomistic systems or they can be measured experimentally. Either way, we know how to proceed with this uh, theoretical formalism. Now, this is only half of the story. That's the uh, free energy of the system. When we go to active systems with proteins, we need to worry about dynamics and hydrodynamics, the flows that are generated by the material as it moves. These are always out of equilibrium. So this free energy that you see here has to be coupled to a solution of the Navier-Stokes equation. And both of them have to be solved simultaneously. So the idea is again, not complicated. You're generating uh, stresses. Those stresses that you generate from the elastic forces have to be included in the Navier-Stokes equations. As you solve the Navier-Stokes equations for the velocity profile, you calculate the velocities as a function of position. Those velocities generate stresses that influence the structure. And as you change the structure, you generate more stresses. So these are two coupled equations that you solve simultaneously. And the answer for it is an entire picture of the dynamics as a function of time, of course, as a function of structure and as a function of position in the system. The way that we're gonna introduce uh, active stresses in the system is by adding one more term to the stress tensor that is related to the local order in the system. All right, the details are, are again, not important. They're described in these publications. So we put a lot of things together that uh, might not necessarily uh, work well. These are new theories. These things haven't been uh, characterized before. Um, there's many assumptions uh, that go into these equations that I haven't told you about. So it is important to have an experimental system in which to validate some of the predictions. We see such a, such a system in this um, experiment. So these are experiments again by uh, the dog H group in which they've actually uh, localized or uh, segregated these uh, microtubules to the surface of a sphere. So these are shells of tubules, shells of liquid crystals. 
It is a two-dimensional system that has been projected onto the surface of a droplet. With colors, you see the topological defects. By construction, you can only have four defects on the surface of a sphere. So think of a baseball that has the four lobes of the, <clears throat> of the leather uh, on it. And because the system is active, you see the defects constantly moving throughout the surface. Now it turns out that uh, these defects are moving in regular orbits. So if you draw vectors from the center of the droplet to the core of the defects, you will see that, that you oscillate between a planar structure and a tetrahedral structure. In the tetrahedral mode, the angle between the vectors is 110 degrees. In the planar mode, it is 120 degrees. And in here, you see that angle going up, down, up, down, up, down. Those are the oscillations that I was telling you about. Now, when these um, experiments were first uh, uh, proposed, the authors assumed that you could represent the motion of these defects using uh, uh, balls that are localized on the surface of the sphere connected by springs. And on the basis of that, they made the predictions that you see here uh, on the right. What they didn't do is take into account the hydrodynamics that arise in the system, the flows that arise in the system. So with our model, we can introduce that and see if the picture uh, changes. So you find that um, at first sight, the uh, agreement between uh, experiment and simulations is uh, quantitative. The images look uh, the same, both in uh, experiments and uh, simulations. So that serves as validation. But now you can actually calculate the flows that are generated by the defects moving. And they're actually very, very interesting. And once you follow closely the trajectories of the defects, the path that they follow, you find that it is very different when you take into account hydrodynamic forces than when you don't. The motion is actually different. That's something that was not appreciated in the first experiments. It was subsequently understood on the basis of these calculations. And to validate the merit of these new results, one had to uh, find another experimental system on which to test these ideas. So one idea was to uh, predict what is the motion of the defects when you move away from a spherical shell and you go onto an ellipsoidal shape. When that happens, the nature of these trajectories changes a lot. You have modes in which the defects are stagnant for a long time at the point of, at the, at the poles of the ellipsoid. Eventually, there's a fluctuation that takes them somewhere else and they travel very quickly from the bottom of the ellipse to the middle. And then they interchange positions. You see that happening now the sense of the rotation changes and this process continues. So these are very definite predictions that uh, rely heavily on the flows and the hydrodynamics. Uh, recently, a collaborator, uh, Teresa Lopez in Paris, was actually incredibly uh, able to uh, stabilize ellipses of tubulin. That's the experiment that you see uh, uh, on the right now. And uh, if you follow closely the motion of these defects, you will see that uh, they're exactly what uh, we were anticipating would ha happen on the basis of calculations. So to us now, this really serves as a confirmation of the validity of these theoretical approaches. And again, it gives us confidence that we can use them to start to design uh, these types of materials. Okay, so that is the uh, second part of the talk, the uh, study of these defects now in polymeric systems and in active systems. The third and last part of the talk is trying to uh, control the motion of these defects by using different strategies so that we can perhaps start to do useful things with these types of, uh, of materials. So let me tell you what we're doing in that, uh, in that context. 
Now, everything that I showed you so far had to do with uh, tubulin, right? So microtubules. And one of the problems with uh, working with microtubules and most of the experimental work, unfortunately, in these classes of materials has been done with microtubules is that the density is very low. So these are dilute suspensions of microtubules. And as a result of that, you have um, very large concentration of density fluctuations throughout the system. And our theoretical models are not uh, well suited yet to handle those fluctuations of concentration. So we had to come up with a system that is more homogeneous and more akin to a small molecule liquid crystalline system. So we ended up working with uh, actin. So again, these are protein filaments. They're very long. They can measure um, <clears throat> uh, tens of, uh, of microns. The advantage of using actin in this case with myosin motors is that you can actually cap the growth of those filaments very precisely. And once you do that, you can control the concentration and you can control the length and homogeneity of your molecules. So on the left, I'm going to show you polymerizing actin filaments that are long. As they grow, you go from a disorder phase into a nematic phase, right? So now you see that this is liquid crystalline you start to see defects. But the problem here now is that these filaments are somewhat flexible. They cannot buckle. And we don't like that very much because our theories are again unable to describe that buckling. So what we're gonna do is uh, cap the growth of the filaments to short length scales. We're gonna cap the filaments at about two micron. If you do that, you will see that you form Again, the liquid crystal, you're avoiding the buckling and now it is very uniform and you see the formation of these defects. And now the, uh, what is very interesting about the images that I'm showing you is that this is really reminiscent of the kayak pictures that I showed you at the beginning. If um, you walk away and you look at this image from a distance and you look at the chaos from a distance, the picture will look um, identical uh, to you. And again, you see the formation of the uh, uh, minus one half and the plus one half defects in these fields, all right? Now, um, one of the interesting um, uh, things about these defects, once you go to these longer land scales, is that the actual shape of the defect changes dramatically as you start to manipulate the elasticity of the material. So K3 and K1 are the uh, bend and splay elastic constants for the material. If the uh, bend constant <clears throat> is much smaller than the uh, splay constants, you get these highly curved defects if the uh, ratio is invert, that is if the uh, <clears throat> bend constant is much higher than the splay constant, you get these triangular shaped defects. Now that turns out to be a <clears throat> really um, interesting characteristics of these materials because you think about it, it provides a means for actually measuring elastic constants from pictures in the liquid crystal. For biological systems, we don't have too much data yet. We do not know what these constants are in general. So using these images to extract mechanical properties becomes a really uh, interesting uh, possibility. So what we're gonna do then is characterize the shape of the defect using the uh, diagram that you see over here. So we're gonna go to the core of the defect and then we're going to measure the uh, orientation of the liquid crystal around the defect as we draw a circle around it. And that's what you see over here on the right. I'll play that movie again. I'm going around the defect, measuring the orientation as I travel. I plot the trace of that angle, and that's the curve that you see on the right. 
And now, depending on the <clears throat> shape of the defect and the rate of the elastic constant, I will get a curve that is concave up or concave down. That's exactly the curve that corresponds to the images that I showed you earlier and that you see on the right. So the calculations, this is the shape of the defect. So now I take this very simple idea and I apply it, but on top of experimental images. So that's what you see over here. So on the top, you have the uh, light microscope uh, images that I had shown you uh, a moment ago. In red, I'm superimposing a plot of the director from our analysis of those uh, images. We use that then to characterize the defect, as I told you a moment ago. And depending on the type of material, I get a curve that is concave up or concave down. The points are experimental data from those images. The lines are our fit to those experimental data. Now, once I have the uh, fits, I can actually extract the rate of these elastic constants by using the models that we have uh, uh, been working with. If the rate is below unity, you get a concave down. If it is above unity, concave up. All right. The key point here is that now I can measure elastic constants from experimental images of active systems. That's all that I wanted to say with this. And with that, characterize the system really, really well. All right, so that's the uh, equilibrium structure of the liquid crystal. Now let me say something about the dynamics. So let's assume that you have two oppositely charged defects in a liquid crystal. And let's assume for the moment that uh, they attract each other and that um, hydrodynamics are not important. Well, in that case, on the top, we have two defects that are perpendicular to the director of the system. In the bottom, we have the same two defects, but in this case, they are parallel to the director of the system. If the ans in the absence of hydrodynamics, they simply attract each other until they disappear. And you notice that in this case, the rate of approach of the defects is the same regardless of whether you're parallel or perpendicular. Now in the middle, we do the exact same calculation, but now we take hydrodynamics into account. Remember, as the defects move, they generate flows and the flows change everything. When we play that movie, you see that now the rate of approach of the two defects in the two situations is actually different. It is fast when the defects are perpendicular to the director. It is slow when it is parallel to the director. All right. And the lines are streaming lines, lines of constant velocity in the system. So are these predictions true? Is, is, is it really the case that you can have fast or slow moving uh, defects? So to uh, address that question, we turn to um, experiments. So now these are the images that I showed you uh, a moment ago. We played movies of the defects. And uh, in red, I'm showing you defects that are perpendicular to the director. In blue, I'm showing you pairs of defects that are parallel to the director. And what you find is that the red defects indeed move very quickly and disappear. And the blue defects move actually very slowly and it takes forever for them to actually annihilate each other. So that seems to be consistent with the predictions that we have made. All right, so that's now uh, reassuring because we're starting to go into uh, directions for which there's very little guidance from, uh, from, uh, from previous uh, work. Um, one great way of testing the validity of these models is to uh, do what we call uh, weather predictions. So just like the weather people take images of the weather, the clouds, the winds right now, and use that as an initial condition to tell you what happens over the next three days, we're going to take an image of our experiments right now and then try to predict what happens over the next 10 minutes or half an hour or several hours and see if what we see agrees with the uh, experiments. So, on the right, you have the uh, simulations. On the left, you have the experiments. 
we're putting in some arrows here so that you can actually uh, uh, focus on a few regions of the system. You can actually see that the agreement is uh, very, very good. It's actually quantitative. And the surprising thing is that uh, this is quantitative over very long periods of time. And these are 10 minutes. 10 minutes for somebody who actually works on simulations is eternity. And uh, if you take into account the simplicity of the ingredients that went into these calculations, just a few elastic constants and the viscosity, it is really remarkable that you can uh, capture all of these. And in retrospect, the reason is actually uh, simple. These are really systems that are governed completely by the elasticity of the material. That's really what matters. So once you know where the defects are, it becomes a relatively simple feature to uh, predict how the system evolves. All right, now, everything that I showed you so far has to do with systems that are not active. I haven't put in any motor proteins in the material yet. It is just trying to go to equilibrium on its own. So the next step becomes putting in uh, uh, proteins. So that's what you see over here. The proteins are now shown in uh, green. You see that the moment that I put in the proteins, things move a lot faster. And then as a function of time, these proteins start to clump, they become inactivated and the dynamics start to go back. All right, so same system as before, but now it is autonomous, it has activity. And one of the questions that do, uh, we ask becomes, um, do defects change? Does the uh, structure of the system change at all when you introduce activity? The answer is shown uh, uh, here. Um, on the left, we have the uh, experimental system at rest. And you see that these defects are triangular in shape, meaning that the uh, structure of the system is dominated by the band elasticity, the resistance to bend. I take that system and I put proteins. I don't change anything else. And all of a sudden you see that the shape of the defect becomes a lot more rounded. So one way to interpret this is to say that uh, the role of activity or motor proteins is to reduce the effective band elasticity of the material. That is shown on the panel here on the lower left. You go from K33 over K11 being higher than unity to becoming smaller than unity upon the introduction of activity. And again, this agrees very nicely with, uh, with theory. See the experiment on the left. You see that uh, the defects become a lot more curved as you introduce activity. Now you can start to make all the predictions, which are uh, how do things change as you turn on, up or down the uh, activity. And that's a very interesting story, but I will not, uh, have time to, uh, uh, to uh, discuss it. Now, second question that arises is um, if you start to make the activity higher, um, do you generate more defects or fewer defects? And why is that an interesting question? Well, you can see how if you make the dynamics go faster, you can actually reach equilibrium faster and most of these defects will disappear. Or you could say if you introduce faster dynamics, more turbulence, you're just going to be generating many more defects. So what is the answer? Well, the answer is shown here on the, um, on the left. You see that as the, I increase the concentration of proteins, the number of defects that are shown with these blue and red symbols actually increases. You see that as you increase those number of defects, the uh, velocity in the system, the magnitude, of the streamlines becomes higher and you see again more disorder into the system and that seems to be consistent between experiments and uh, and uh, simulations now controlling the number of defects in experiments is, is is very hard but in calculations you can do super precise uh, reconstructions of the system one really interesting analogy that emerges is that um, 
defects in these liquid crystals can be viewed as uh, ionic particles interacting with each other in a hydrodynamic continuum, right? So think about charged colloidal particles in a fluid, defects can be treated using the same methods. So that's uh, illustrated with a movie that you see on the left, where you see these particles uh, uh, floating around. Once you talk about particles in a liquid, you immediately think about the order that they have. You can calculate uh, uh, radial distribution functions. And you find that the radial distribution functions that uh, you see in the active system for defects are completely analogous to the ones that you find in colloidal systems. You can actually be quantitative about predicting those. Um, if, our, if defects can be viewed as particles, they should be governed by a chemical potential. So I can make an analogy to a grand canonical ensemble, fix the chemical potential, that would be the activity, and use that to control the average concentration of defects. And that's what you see on the right. There's an equilibrium concentration or a steady state concentration that corresponds to an activity or, or a chemical potential. And again, the fluctuations of the number of defects have a very well-defined uh, statistical mechanical meaning that we can discuss later if you want. So that's a really interesting uh, outcome of these uh, uh, results. Now, um, I told you that I wanted to control defects. So let me uh, spend the last five minutes of my talk telling you how we want to do that. And the genesis of this idea is shown in the experiments on the right. Now, I told you at the beginning that defects, plus and minus, are supposed to attract each other and annihilate each other. The moment you go to active systems, you find that that is not always the case. In some cases, pairs of defects actually maintain their distance. And in some cases, they actually seem to repel each other, which is completely contrary to how we started this uh, this uh, uh, conversation. So for a long time, we were puzzled by, uh, by these uh, results. And we started to uh, play around with controlling the local activity on the system. We started to create patterns of activity. And we found some really interesting surprises. The first one is shown here. So you have two defects, as I showed you before. For uniform activity, they're supposed to attract each other and disappear. What I've done here is I've made the activity inside this little rectangle higher than it is in the rest of the material. All right, now there's not a physical boundary to this box. It's just a gradient of activity. Now look at what happens. That defect, instead of moving in a straight line to the right, actually stays in the box. And it creates these really interesting localized flows. It never escapes the box that you see here. It is almost as if it is hitting a physical wall from which it is reflected. But there's no wall there. It's just a gradient of activity. I'll play that again. You see that it reaches the boundary and then it just travels along the boundary. All right, so we saw that and we thought, hmm, let's do another experiment. Let's just put a big wall and divide the entire region. So there's not a physical boundary, only a gradient of activity. On the left, on the left, high activity. On the right, low activity. If we turn on the dynamics, and you see that defects actually stay on the left. And once they reach this boundary, they're either reflected, or if they venture a little bit into the right, they're immediately pulled back like a slingshot onto the left. So gradients of activity are actually functioning as walls. So um, in here, you see some stale images on the left of the concentration of defects, many defects on the high activity region, very few on the low activity. And you actually start to see an accumulation of defects at the interface. And now in retrospect, this could have been predicted. You see, defects carry a charge. And whenever you have two media that have different dielectric constants, for example, a metallic particle 
in air or in a different uh, liquid. We know that charge accumulates at that interface. It becomes polarized. Well, that's exactly what happens in this system. That interface is becoming polarized and you see an increase in the number of minus one half defects at the interface. <coughs> <clears throat> this is independent of geometry, et cetera. And that's what happens. So uh, does this happens in experiments? All of those were predictions. So very recently, uh, uh, my colleague, Margaret Gardell, was able, able to engineer proteins that are light sensitive. So these myosin motors become more active when you shine light on them. And what she's done in this experiment is she shines light into the uh, square rectangle here. So this would become a high activity region. The rest outside is a low activity region. And in here you see one defect that we're gonna follow with the camera. See that it reaches the uh, surface. And then just like the calculation that I showed you, the defect travels along the surface. So we were super excited about this when we saw it because it seems to confirm what uh, the theory was, was telling you. This does happen for just one defect. You can actually follow many defects. And these are the traces of those defects in the experiment. And you see that for the most part, they actually remain on the, on the surface. Every now and then somebody gets lucky and travels outside, but it is immediately pulled back into the system just as we had uh, anticipated, all right? So, um, we can start to design uh, patterns in the system. And immediately now, this uh, starts to uh, give you ideas as to how one can create microfluidic devices that are autonomous, that work on their own, but that are governed by gradients in activity. So that's an example in which we have two defects traveling right. The pink region is high activity. The gray region is low activity. If the high activity region is a straight line, the defect stays within the high activity line and it goes along in this direction. You change the pattern of light and you make a zigzag and now you see that the defects start to go along the high activity region. So you can actually control uh, these systems. So uh, what can you do with this? Well, one thing that we're excited about is creating um, uh, devices that allow you to do uh, logic operations. So uh, in here, we have uh, superconductivity in a liquid crystal. So we create defects locally. And by using this type of geometry where the triangles have high activity, we can actually get defects to travel super fast along the system over very long distances without any losses. You can create um, gates. So in here we have a defect. There's low activity, the passive system, high activity. If you pattern these total regions, you actually turn on the gate. So you open it and the defect can cross. When this is turned off, the defect is trapped here and it goes back left. So now you start to see uh, an analogy between electrons and topological defects in liquid crystals. The moment you realize there's such an analogy, everything that we know from uh, electronic circuits can be applied to design of topological defect circuits. The last example has to do with uh, um, amplification. So in here I have a defect amplifier. We have one defect on the left the moment that I can create a pattern of activity such as the one shown here on the uh, in pink, you see that as the defect travels, it actually generates all of the defects that you see here at the corners and it releases them at the top. So you have one defect that becomes many, as many as you have pink branches in the device. And the story goes on and on and on. So now what is the challenge? Well, we need to, uh, uh, be able to do this in experiments. And so far, our success has been uh, uh, limited, but uh, we're trying. We'll see what comes out of this. So I'll stop now and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Juan. That was an amazing talk. Extremely uh, cool stuff. Lots, uh, lots to think about there. Um, so there's one sort of clarifying question that Gareth McKinley wanted, but he thought we should wait till the end. And then I have some other questions and I'm sure you've got a huge audience. So there'll be a lot of questions. Um, so in your hydrodynamic um, or in the model that you include, could you talk a little bit more about the hydrodynamic interactions? Were they anisotropic non-interacting rods? Is there attractive interactions? Is it 2D planar or 3D with the inner outer bulk? Um, so Gareth uh, can ask yeah. more if I, I left anything out. No, I think you've got it all. Um, basically, in, the, in part two of your talk, one, and I know you, you didn't want to go into HI too much, but what exactly form of the potential do you use? Yeah, so um, there are no rods in the system. It is a continuum. It's a continuum theory. So, so what, what's the yeah, potential, essentially? So the potential is this free energy. Right, so the free mm -hmm. energy assigns a structure to the system. It makes it anisotropic, and it gives you a, a, an order parameter given by this tensor. Right, the value of the tensor changes as a function of position. Sometimes it is high, where you have a aligned material. Sometimes it is low, where you have a defect. Right, and and all of that structure is captured here. Yeah, you know, I guess what, I, what I'm really asking about is the rate dependence, or in other words, the hydrodynamic part. Oh, so well, that, that's, how do you that's, couple the hydrodynamics? That's, 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 that's the tricky bit. That's the tricky bit. So the, um, uh, all of that free energy is in here, in this term. All right. All of the coupling to the velocity is in this term. Here, this is just advection. And then this velocity that goes in here or into the coupling is given by solving the Navier-Stokes equations. Except that the stress here, right, has whatever is coming from the fluid and it has the derivative of the free energy, which gives you an additional stress. And it also has the active stress. So that's how the helping happens. And these are just the uh, uh, Barry's Edwards equations. So this is the various Edwards model as described in their book with a few tweaks. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And really nice talk, by the way. Just the amazing movies. The agreement between experiment and theory is pretty incredible, actually. Yeah. Truly incredible. Okay. Sh Shana, do you want to go ahead and unmute and um, introduce yourself and ask your question directly? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, that stuff. At, at the end in particular, it's pretty wild agreement. Really cool. Thank you for sharing it. Um, I was curious about the ellipsoids. So I am definitely not a liquid crystal person. It seemed to me that the defects you had were moving symmetrically from like the poles. And I was wondering, is that requisite or is that a coincidence or will it always happen? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a coincidence. It, it not a, it's not a requisite the motion of these defects is very sensitive to a number of features. First of all, very sensitive to the thickness of these two-dimensional shells. Uh, as you can imagine, as the shell becomes thicker, you go from a two-dimensional system to a three-dimensional system and things change. It is very sensitive to the shape of the ellipsoid. And then it is incredibly sensitive to the friction of the uh, liquid crystal at the interface with the substrate that you have inside the ellipsoid. So what I can tell you is that uh, the way you make these shells is by having a smectic liquid crystal. And then on top of the smectic, you have the tubulin system, that shell. And then outside you have water with uh, tubulin. So because you have a smectic system, in the middle, the friction in the middle is anisotropic. And the molecules can actually move faster in one direction than in another. And that gives an orientation to the material, as you see on the left, that is very important for the dynamics of the defect. So it's a lot more complicated than, than I told you. And I just chose one movie, but that's a whole other story that- uh, Okay. And they can annihilate each other in this geometry? 
No, no, they cannot. Just as in the sphere, if you want to uh, have a pneumatic liquid crystal on a curved surface, you need to have for a sphere four defects. For okay. an ellipsoid, you can have four or more, and that's a requisite. Thank you. You know, it's like uh, people that have hair, not me, but people that have hair here on the top, they have a little defect, right? And you need to have that because otherwise <laughs> there's just no way for your hair to be organized. Same thing uh, in, uh, in these liquid crystals. So one, um, the actomycin work is gorgeous and it's fun to see you collaborating. Uh, with someone we tried to hire and couldn't get at MIT. Um, so in, in, the, in vivo, the actomycin, there's a lot of other molecules around and there's energy involved in actual movement. How do you, how do you move from your simulations and the um, very uh, model experiments to starting to interpret movement inside cells or do you just use actomycin more as a model for what you might do with synthetic materials? Well, it's a really interesting question. I think here is just a model mm -hmm. that um, we like very much because uh, you can control the length of the molecules and the elastic constants. So uh, there wasn't much thought given as to uh, how you would use these two model uh, biological systems. What that is changing is actually uh, in applying all of these ideas to um, um, films of epithelial cells, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that these cells can be treated as liquid crystals. They have uh, defects, they're uh, active systems. And now by uh, patterning the activity, for example, with nutrients of those epithelial cell systems, you can reproduce almost all of the features that you see over here. So now for design of these uh, logic operation systems, we're moving away from active and we're doing it with actual cells, films of cells. And that seems to be working out pretty well. Which cells? Uh, these are just um, epithelial cells, I am told. That, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, a colleague no, of we see team. a lot of morphogenesis. We should talk later because I do a lot with epithelial morphogenesis. Uh, it, morphogenesis of um, epithelial layers. This is something we're very actively involved in in lab right now. Okay, well, uh, absolutely. I'll tell you more about that. Not much from a theoretical side. We got to get the experiments working first, but we've got something. So we have we can have a lot to talk about. Yeah. Um, so does anybody else from the audience, um, Merit, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, Juan, I have a question about uh, this charge interface that you showed. Yeah. And it uh, appears to um, contain some positively charged defects in it. So. My thought is that if you have a full body, then the charged particles would form on one end of the body and the negative charged particles would go to the other end of the body as analogous to what happened in electrostatics. Would it be useful to separate uh, positive defects from negative defects? And then you can probably direct them to whatever you want. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, um... So first of all, you see in this figure over here that uh, the accumulation is for one of the charges of the defects, for the minus one half defects, not for the other ones. The other ones are in fact uh, uh, depleted. Mm -hmm. And you need to have uh, uh, electron neutrality. So on average, the same number of plus and minus uh, defects. Um, yes, separating plus and minus defects is very, very important. When I showed you those results for a superconductivity of topological defects, we're actually working only with um, plus one half defects. Yeah. Because those are the ones that can travel very fast. The minus one half defects are very, very slow. Okay. And but then, if, if you have two interfaces, the one interface would be with positive defects and another one would be with negative. Uh, Again, because of electron neutrality. Well, we haven't done the two interfaces, but yes, that's what would, what I anticipate would happen. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, 
Madhu, go ahead and ask your question about hydrodynamics. Unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask your question. Hi, um, again, wonderful talk. Thank you so much for the um, talk. So I have a question. Like I understand that these systems, I mean, these, these uh, molecules are very small, around a few nanometers, and their ordering is typically because of the thermodynamic potentials, right? But when there is this, when the, when when there is a flow happening or the dynamic state of the system, does the ordering of the system affected by hydrodynamic interaction between these these uh, these crystals, like at least in micron particle systems, the hydrodynamic interactions do uh, uh, govern the order of the system. Uh, does does the same thing applies in the in these pneumatic systems? Yeah, um, uh, absolutely. I think uh, let me clarify something. The uh, pictures that I showed you at the beginning with five CB and eight CB, those are thermotropic liquid crystals small molecules that measure a nanometer. And, and that's one area. But everything that I showed you for active systems is done with uh, filamentous protein liquid crystals, actin and tubulin. And the size of these molecules is several microns. So they're very big. Right? You can see them with your own eyes. Okay, now in that system, you can see over here that the moment that you turn the flows on, if you look at the order in the system, for example, the shape of one defect, it changes from that to that. So yes, the moment that you turn on hydrodynamics and flows and activity, the system thinks that it has a lower elasticity than it has at rest. It becomes a lot more flexible. And because it becomes more flexible, the shape actually changes. And it is all driven by the hydrodynamics, by the flows. The flows are what doing all of the work here. Yeah, I understand the, the far field flow affecting, because in, in your modeling, the velocity coupling is the, it, it's the far field that goes into the, the equation. Yes. Uh, whereas, pair particle interaction, pair particle hydrodynamic interactions. I was wondering if they are important as well in ordering. Ah, I see what you're saying. Uh, well, they don't rise here because even though I said that this was a more concentrated system, the concentration continues to be pretty low. So the average distance between any of these two uh, rods or filaments is going to be uh, relatively large and lubrication forces, those type of interactions, near field interactions, don't come into play. And the evidence of that is that we can describe all these experiments really well by using just the far flow. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah. OK, um, Alex Cohen has a question about controlling the defects. Uh, hi, hey. Professor De Palma. How are you? Good to see you. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you too. Are so, they treating, uh, you, are they treating you well at MIT? Because you, uh, yeah. you can always come back to Chicago. <laughs> it's good, good so far, but playing a lot of tennis, so, so that's good. Um, so, I had a question. I remember, um, so I, I remember seeing you pre present some of this stuff uh, before. And it's super interesting. Um, and I remember previously you had mentioned uh, using you know, light to control like transport of, of particles localized to defects. And you like framed it as like maybe creating an optimization problem. Like, can you find an optimal sequence of light flashes to transport some uh, particle in a defect from one spot to another? Um, and I was wondering if, if that uh, like if, if people have looked into that more and, and tried to like, solve a problem like that. Um, yeah, so, so uh, that's what I was alluding to at the end, but we're trying to do it with uh, cell-based uh, systems. And what they're using is actually uh, pulses of oxygen 
to make some cells faster than others, a sequence of pulses. And that's the strategy that seems to be working. But all of that is somewhat premature at this point. So, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed to show the results yet. I need to understand that better. But that's where that work is going. Okay. Um, I think that we've had a really excellent discussion of this really tremendously beautiful and inspiring talk with so much in it. Um, so I think let's thank uh, Professor DePablo uh, for sharing his work with us today and discussing.